the dreaded apostrophe. The amount of pain, carnage, misery that is created by essentially a tiny squashed insect on the page is completely disproportionate. So let's crack it. The first kind of apostrophe use we're going to talk about is the possessive apostrophe, which is showing ownership over something by something else. So let's say take Dan. Now Dan has some students and they feel some sense of delight. Now I could talk about Dan's students' delight if I use a couple of apostrophes. Now how do I figure out where to place the apostrophes? Well the first thing I do is I write out my meaning in full. So Dan has some students who in turn have a sense of delight. Dan has some students who have delight. Now because Dan has some students that's where the possessive idea comes in. Dan possesses them. Sorry, Dan owns you at this point, at least grammatically. So I can talk about Dan's students. So what I actually do is I replace the idea of has some with an apostrophe and an S. So I talk about Dan's students. And you see, because I've written that out in full, I know where the apostrophe goes. There's the word Dan, then apostrophe, then S. So I say, Dan's students. Right. The students who have delight. Ah, this is some, the delight belongs to the students. The delight does not belong to Dan. The delight belongs to the students. So I can talk about students who have delight. So again, same process, I'm going to remove this idea of who have, and I'm going to replace it with an apostrophe. And logically, you'd expect me to put an apostrophe S. Problem is, that creates a rather ugly sound when we read it out loud. Dan's students' delight. And I've said in an earlier video that grammar tends to follow what people say. And when something is quite ugly or awkward to say, it tends to drop out of the language. And what we've done just to smooth the sound of our language, we've removed that compulsory final S that usually is followed by a possessive apostrophe. So if the word itself ends in S, we just put an apostrophe. So here we go, students, apostrophe, I miss out who have, and I finally end up with delight. So you'll see now that my phrase is Dan's students delight. So I can go back here and say Dan apostrophe S, students, final apostrophe right at the end, and then delight. And I've got my phrase. It's incredibly important where we place apostrophes. For example, if I misplaced my apostrophe to here, I've reduced my class down to one student. Because Dan has a student who has a sense of delight, which means... I would go, Dan has a, apostrophe S, student, apostrophe S, then delight. So that's how I get Dan's student's delight. So the delight is owned by a student, not a group of students. So particularly if your word ends in S, be really careful about where you place your apostrophe, because it may actually change whether you're talking about one thing or many.
Contractions are where we also can use apostrophes, particularly with informal writing, not so much with formal writing. We could use an apostrophe to join two words, did not, into did, n apostrophe t. And the apostrophe is showing us that there's a letter there, o, that we've removed, didn't. But like I say, in formal writing, we tend not to contract like this and write out our words in full. This is the one that most often mucks us up with apostrophes. The trouble is that following that contraction rule, we can take the phrase it is, and we can add the two words together, and remove the I of is to create its. So we could say a sentence like, it's sunny today. It is. Now bear in mind I've said in formal writing we don't tend to contract. So we would, I don't know why we'd be writing formally about the weather, but we would say it is. That use, apostrophe S, has been taken over by contractions. And so, if I was to say, going back to the band Blur, Blur needed to up its game. Now, according to our possessive apostrophe rule, it would be blur needed to up the game that it had, the game that belonged to blur. So you would think you would put an apostrophe in there. Blur needed to up the game that belonged to it, meaning blur. This is the one exception with apostrophes. Because it apostrophe s always means the phrase it is, you can't use an apostrophe in that situation because what you're really saying is blur needed to up, it is gain, which makes absolutely no sense. So because the word it is a pronoun, we don't use apostrophes in our pronouns. So that's the only time that something can be owned without using an apostrophe. It's a possessive situation, but we do not use an apostrophe. A really simple way to think about the word it's is just remember, never use an apostrophe in the word it's unless you mean it is. And if you YouTube the apostrophe song, there's even a catchy little chorus using exactly those words. Never use an apostrophe in it's unless you mean it is. So every time you hit the word it's, just ask yourself, do I mean it is? If I mean it is, I use an apostrophe. Any other meaning of it's, particularly the possessive ones, we do not use an apostrophe. A woefully common error is to use the apostrophe to make plurals. There you go. <laughs> so let's say uh, I have one tomato, and all of a sudden I have six tomatoes, I put an apostrophe S. Yes. Absolutely wrong. The only time that you'll ever see apostrophes used to create plurals is if we have an abbreviation. We've got the word compact disc. And if I have three compact discs, I can just put an S on it. If I abbreviate this to the standard capital C, capital D, the S just looks a little bit odd connected into those capitals, and so you'll tend to find an apostrophe used in that situation. That's the only time 
that you'll use an apostrophe to go from a singular, like one CD, to a plural of CDs. Any other time, do not use the apostrophe for plurals.